in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England, and I'd like to present a case of a neonatal presentation of severe bronchomalacia in a baby with cystic fibrosis. I have no conflict of interest to declare. So reviewing the birth history, uh, this baby had an older brother with cystic fibrosis, and so she was tested antenatally and confirmed to have Delta F508 deletion. Uh, antenatally, it was also detected that she had echogenic bowel and evidence of polyhydramnios, and she went on to be delivered at 35 weeks gestation by caesarean section, um, weighing between the 50th and 75th percentile. On day one of life, meconium ileus was confirmed during laparotomy, and she had uh, intestinal obstruction with that, and a jejunostomy was formed. She was then extubated within five days, um, off all, all respiratory support uh, and was progressing well, having support with some parenteral nutrition and establishing enteral feeds. As she approached two weeks of age, she started to develop some mild tachypnea and increased work of breathing. And around three weeks of age, there was a desaturation episode uh, after she'd had a bottle feed and she developed a new oxygen requirement. Around six weeks of age, there was a second episode like this, and previously she'd been screened for infection and the only positive findings were some Klebsiella and respiratory secretions. At this point, it was noted she had slightly raised carbon dioxide levels on a capillary gas. And a chest x-ray, which was done, you can see above. Uh, so you can see that she's got significant hyperinflation of her left lung, particularly the upper lobe, and this is causing mediastinal shift over to the right side. There's also obvious opacification of the right upper lobe um, and likely some collapse there. She went on to have a bronchoscopy, which confirmed a slit-like left main bronchus, um, which you can see in the photograph. As the weeks went on, she had to start some high flow oxygen therapy to support her work of breathing and oxygen requirement. She had an echocardiogram, which confirmed that the heart structure was normal. And she also had a CT scan to look for any, any um, other structures that might be compressing and causing this mediastinal shift. And this did confirm that there was a right upper lobe consolidation, that the left main bronchus was patent, but very much flattened, and the hyperinflation that you could see in the chest X-ray. Unfortunately, as the weeks went on, by the time she was two months of age, she was becoming very tachypneic. Uh, gases were getting worse and carbon dioxide level um, was now almost 12. And she uh, required almost 70% oxygen to maintain her saturations. So she was admitted to intensive care and invasively ventilated. And at this point, you can see on her chest X-ray that mediastinal shift and hyperinflation was just getting worse and worse. So she had a bronchoscopy and the decision was made um, to attempt a biodegradable stent. Now, as far as we are aware from literature searches, this has not been tried in a patient with cystic fibrosis before. And we discussed using tracheostomy with long-term ventilation and some positive pressure. However, we're concerned about um, infection risk um, with a loss of upper airway uh, defences um, and felt that a biodegradable stem would hopefully allow enough time uh, for her airway to grow and her to be able to uh, cope without any respiratory support herself. So this was a bronchus uh, at the time of insertion and this was the stent just after it was inserted. The stent integrity was estimated to last between four to six weeks so we were expecting that she potentially would need a second stent inserted. So following the stent insertion, she made excellent progress. She was extubated within four days uh, and quickly on to low flow oxygen, requiring very minimal support. She also tolerated a reversal of her jejunostomy and again was extubated successfully from that procedure. And in total, she'd been ventilated for 31 days prior to the stent insertion. However, five weeks after the stent insertion, she was noted to have increased work of breathing and oxygen requirements, and we wondered about the stent integrity. She had to be restarted on high flow nasal cannula, and repeat bronchoscopy had shown that the stent had actually migrated slightly and started to block uh, the left upper lobe um, with pro bronchomalacia detected. Um, so you can see here, there's not much evidence of the stent present. Um, although the bronchus probably looks slightly more patent than previously, it's still very much flattened. And, um, and you can see actually there's loss of the left upper lobe on the chest x-ray, although the mediastinal shift is significantly better. So a second stent was then inserted uh, nine weeks after the initial stent. 
and she was successfully discharged home eight weeks later off all respiratory support, fully enterally fed with her weight nicely on the 25th percentile. Uh, as the years have gone, she's progressed very well. And this is the most recent chest X-ray um, at three years of age. Um, you could probably still convince yourself there's uh, possibly a bit of hyperinflation still of that left upper lobe, but no evidence of consolidation. And actually, she has quite nice lungs uh, for a three year old with CF. Briefly to touch on structural airway abnormalities and cystic fibrosis, a group in Iowa have done quite a lot of work on uh, newborn CF piglets um, who have had all their CFTR eradicated. And comparing these piglets with controls, um, they've, they've seen that they're smaller um, and less circular tracheas. Um, also, they've noted that the smooth muscle mass is increased in these newborn piglets um, and that they have small and hypoplastic submucosal glands. Also in uh, infants with CF, although the, the studies are small and, and limited in, in viability and uh, feasibility, um, they've shown that uh, in children, their tracheas tend to be less circular uh, in cross section than control patients. Um, but also uh, the lumen size, it, it tends to be similar to controls. Uh, and this would suggest and possibly support the idea that CFTR plays a role in uh, structural airway um formation uh, prior to the onset of infection and inflammation so possibly um, CFTR actually uh, is it could be a primary process rather than um, an acquired process from disease. This would also be supported um, from CT uh, scans and some infant lung function that was being done on these um, newborn CF piglets um, which has shown that the air trapping in these uh, newborn piglets is also significantly greater. Also, the lumen size um, has been reduced on CT scanning and also they've shown evidence of increased airway res resistance. So actually, functionally, uh, these piglets already seem to be at a disadvantage from day, day one of life. We also know um, from previous studies that the childhood population incidence of tracheobronchoblasia is generally reported between 1 in 1400 and 1 in 2100. And they, this is in uh, healthy children. Um, However, the patients with cystic fibrosis have had a prevalence reported between 13.9 and 15% um, in smaller studies, but uh, suggesting there's a much uh, more significant proportion of patients affected. This also tends to be more prevalent in those under two. And significantly, um, this has also been supported to show that of these children, uh, pseudomonas uh, infection tends to be acquired um, 1.3 years earlier in, in a study that was done in patients with tracheomalacia and CF. And also by eight years of age, they had a lower median predicted FEV1 uh, by almost 20%, but there was no difference in the frequency of bronchiectasis. So in summary, tracheomalacia is more common in children with CF than the general pop population. Animal studies, um, although they're small in number, suggest that the lack of CFTR may contribute to congenital disease of the airways before the onset of infection. And biodegradable bronchial stenting from what we've shown in our patient can be safely used without causing significant microbiological change or superadded infection in the CF airway. Thank you very much. Put it on again. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation and also a fantastic case, actually. Um, I've never heard anyone doing this in a CF uh, child. Uh, I just, before we can answer the question of the chat, I have one question. Um, have you considered doing uh, autopexy before inserting a stent in this child? I think because it was meant to felt to be bronchial bronchiomalacia rather than tracheomalacia, I don't think aortopexy was considered um, at the time. Um, and at this point, she was unweanable from invasive ventilation. Um, every time we tried to wean, her carbon dioxide level was too high. So, uh, I mean, there was lots of options considered. She was invasively ventilated for I think it was thirty one days in total. So it was you know it was getting quite dangerous and. Um, Sort of life limiting um, concerns about how she was going to progress. So, aortopexy, as far as I think, wasn't 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 discussed. Okay, um, maybe just also about the stent question. Uh, is 
such a stent, maybe you can explain to the audience how it's inserted. Is it done with a flexible bronchoscope? Is it a rigid bronchoscope? And if it blocks, can you take it out again? Or um, is it then inside and it stays inside? So as far as I know, it was a rigid bronchoscope that was used. Um, we did have uh, cardiologists who, who are present who do a lot of stent insertion, vascular stent insertion, um, who would usually support any bronchial stent insertion at our center. So they were, they were present. Um, in terms of um, whether it can be removed, I don't think so, because the way the stent sort of, well, once it's released, it inflates and then it's almost stuck against the, the wall. So it's quite difficult to move um, once, once it's been inserted. But the integrity of the stent was only estimated to be between four and six weeks. Um, so we were expecting her to need at least um, a second stent, if not more than that. And we're pleased that she only needed um, two in total. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I also have two quick questions. Uh, one um, is uh, similar to one of Nicolas. Uh, in the chest, on the chest CT scan, uh, do you uh, uh, actually uh, looked at the the outside of the bronchus to see if uh, the big vessels were? Uh, uh, there was like a compression because if so, autopexy would have been a good idea. Yeah, so they uh, we did do a CT with um, contrast, and it wasn't felt that there was any extrinsic okay. component or anything there that um, that was going to be you know surgically operable. Okay, and regarding the stent, uh, it is very impressive. And uh, so you you told it was like a biodegradable stent, and you just uh, uh, said that uh, the integrity for was uh, four to six weeks. So you expect that after. There is no more stents. Mm -hmm. And what do you do uh, during this uh, interval of uh, four to six weeks regarding physiotherapy? Is there a risk that the stent move uh, during uh, physiotherapy for the CF baby? I don't think she was having physiotherapy at that point. So at our center, we don't um, necessarily do physiotherapy routinely unless it was, you know, at that point, she wasn't having lots of issues with uh, mucus clearance. So in terms of whether whether it could move, I don't know because it's not been done before. Um, but we weren't we weren't doing regular physiotherapy on her. Um, she was extubated within a couple of days of the stent being inserted and had actually left the intensive care unit and been back down to the ward. And then in the time period bef between the two stents, she didn't actually have to go back onto anything higher than high flow oxygen in terms of um, respiratory support. Uh, so, but. In, for regular physiotherapy, we wouldn't have been doing anything very aggressive on her at that age anyway. Okay. Uh, Nicolas, you want to select some questions for, from the chat? Well, one, one is just asking um, if the child still has the stent inside. Uh, well, possibly yes, but it's been degraded, so. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can, you can actually see on the, on the last x-ray, I don't know if you want to go back to that picture, that you can almost see some markings still present, but even in, in the second picture I put up, you can see most of the stent has gone already, and that was, that was done at, uh, I think it was nine weeks after it was inserted, so mo most of it is, is, is biodegraded. So you did that plan, uh, control bronchoscopy, just to look inside. Sorry? You don't. Uh, you didn't do a plan, a second, a third no. bronchoscopy to check. Okay. No, it was just at the time well of now. the second insertion. Okay. Um, two questions, uh, a bit similar to what I asked. Um, if uh, our topic C or someone asks if a posterior tracheal bronchopex C would be another option, I guess this is something I think you have discussed with your surgeons, and they probably. I don't know, felt that that was not uh, enough to relieve the, the, this obstruction. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember at the time, it was three years ago now, so um, I don't remember us talking about aortopexy being a, a, an option um, for this child, but it may have been, you know, because there was no obvious extrinsic obstruction. There. Maybe just as last, a, a comment of one, someone saying that the stents could be removed if required, but there's always danger of tracheal breaking into pieces. So uh, yeah. when I read this, I would not try to remove no. the stent if it <laughs> breaks into pieces in your trachea, or it, if the trachea breaks into pieces, even worse. Okay, so I think we can move on to the next case. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very it was much, great. Caroline. It was great. Thank you. So 
Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So, um, first, I want to declare that I have no um, conflict of interest in presenting this case. Uh, my name is Nada Ibrahim. I'm one of the consultant pediatricians in the um, uh, Royal Stoke Hospital um, um, in England. I'm going to present this case. Um, So this is a 16 year old girl um, with a background of cystic fibrosis. Um, um, she had a complication at, in the neonatal period with meconium ileus and she has a small bowel atresia and microcolon and she has a labrotomy and five centimeters small bowel resected. She also has previous um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and she's on weaning treatment for that. She also has primary uh, nocturnal enuresis. This is a list of medications she's on. All vitamins, um, um, DNA nebulizers, salbutamol and sedatide. She's also on omeprazole. She's taking crayon. And as I mentioned, she's taking prednisolone five milligram. Alternate days, it is a weaning dose uh, for um, ABPB. So she presented in one evening with uh, colicky abdominal pain uh, for two days, uh, associated with nausea. She's um, scoring her pain as 10 out of 10. Pain in, in the epigastric area, radiating down to the suprapubic area. She also has a one day history of vomiting. On the day of admission, she vomited five times. Some of the vomits are bilious vomiting. She was um, uh, passing wind and she opened her bowels on the morning of that day. On examination, her abdomen was found to be soft, but very tender all over. So this is the initial assessment. She has no um, signs of respiratory distress. Cardiovascular examination is normal. Her blood pressure is slightly on the higher side, probably due to pain. She has erythema on the abdomen, uh, which is um, secondary to using hot water to help with the abdominal pain. Her abdomen, as I mentioned, is soft, but it's tender. Initial examination, they did a um, blood gas, which showed normal lactate. She had a chest X-ray on that evening when she was admitted. You can see there she has a portocat in situ um, and the lung fields uh, looks normal compared with the previous um, chest X-rays or no acute um, change. She has abdominal X-ray which showed uh, dilutation of the small bowels and fecal loading on the large bowels. There is no free air and no fluid levels. On the second day, she has an um, um, abdominal ultrasound, which showed the liver is um, um, diffusely echogenic, which keeping with fatty infiltration. She has distended um, gold bladder, but no stones. She has significantly abnormal bowel and the small bowel were dilated, measuring up to 3.6 centimeter. And it contained echogenic material. And this feature um, would keep with, I put XXX, try to get the audience to guess what's the, uh, the, the underlying cause. Um, so um, the, the report of the ultrasound in keeping with uh, DIOS, which is distal interstinal obstruction syndrome. So this CT scan was done uh, 48 hours after admission. I will explain later why this CT scan was done. So the CT scan, as you can see here, showed some dilated uh, small bowel loops. And it's, um, the CT was done with um, oral contrast. So we can see the contrast here on the bowel loop. 
if you look at the um, right iliac fossa area, you can see a mass, the round mass, which is a fecal um, um, mass. And also the large bowel is also loaded with feces. We can notice this is up there on the, on the stomach. And this is a, a small bowel, so you can see that it's dilated. So um, after she was admitted, she was referred to the surgeon because of suspicious of um, intestinal obstruction. After discussion and review by the surgical team, um, they decided to uh, treat conservatively. Um, so she initially received phosphate enema, which goes the result, that's on admission. She was started on IV fluids and she was started on IV antibiotics. Um, she, her management during admission was a bit challenging because she has combination of vomiting and she refused to have an NG tube put down. During the course of admission, she developed acute bowel obstruction, episode of acute bowel obstruction with increasing abdominal pain. And she didn't open her bowels for 48 hours after admission. And she started having more bilious vomiting despite anti-emetic. At this point, an NG tube was passed successfully. And she was started on gastrographene, clean prep, and N-acetylcysteine. She opened her bowels six days after um, admission and she was discharged on day seven. So just talking about distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, it's the risk factors for developing this comorbidity, a severe genotype, pancreatic insufficiency, although there is little evidence supporting this, dehydration, poor control fat, fat malabsorption, uh, history of meconium ileus as in our case, history of previous distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, post-organ transplantation, and CF-related diabetes. So um, the incidence of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome is less in children. It's more in um, um, older um, patients like 20s and 30s of age. It's as um, it's mentioned before um, in the previous talk that it's very important to know this morbidity in children with cystic fibrosis because the differential diagnosis of the presentation can be appendicitis. And also most of the cases with distal intestinal obstruction syndrome is preferred to be managed conservatively and avoid surgical intervention. Um, the treatment um, after um, the episode of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome is to prevent any um, constipation, although there is no um, clear guidelines on um, uh, treatment post um, distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. We usually go in here in the UK with a nice guideline of treatment of constipation because preventing con con constipation is very important. Um, so uh, we usually use Movicol for preventive um, as, as prophylaxis treatment, and we use it for six up to 12 months. But as I mentioned, there is no clear guidelines on, uh, on what treatment we, we use um, post an episode of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation. Um, I might might not have gotten the point. Uh, you said that uh, w or the reason why you did the CT scan was? So the reason it's not a routine investigation for this intestinal obstruction syndrome. The reason is that because she has a previous history of labratomy 
and because she her case was worsened during admission so there was um, discussion with the surgeon about is this due to adhesions from previous surgery rather than distal intestinal obstruction syndrome but routinely we don't we don't uh, do ct to treat so mainly it's clinically from um, history and examination you can suspect distal intestinal obstruction syndrome you do abdominal x-ray um, and sometimes ultrasound but you don't routinely do a ct um, abdomen Absolutely agree. Thank you. Should I ask one or two questions of the of the people? One one is uh, if you can see a DOS in young children one to two years old. So um, during working in a CF unit for three years, I have only seen two patients: this patient and another uh, child of ten years old. So I haven't seen it in younger children. Maybe I can answer this. Yes, this can occur. Uh, I have myself experienced cases of uh, yeah, uh, children of one year of age with DOS, so it can probably occur at every age. Yes. But maybe, I guess, less when the child is exclusively breastfed in the first months of life. But uh, certainly when the child starts eating normal foods, you can have this. Uh, one question, is there a place for rinse rectal daily? That would be profit, I guess. Uh, the question is after the episode to do uh, daily rinses. I can't answer this, and I think no, uh, this is probably not something that we would advise. But, yes, uh, we would. I, yes, I think mainly it will be like preventing constipation rather than exactly. You know, and as shown in my slide also, we would do the same that you advised six to 12 months of Movicol. So, um, uh, polyethylene glycol, yes. Alice? No, no question, so I think we can... Uh, maybe just I have a, a last comment. Yeah. Um, the, the treatment you have given in this severe episode finally was um, to give gastrographene, a clean prep and an acetylcysteine, right? Yes. I would be very happy in this situation with the n cysteine and with the clean prep because the clean prep is the polyenglicol, the same that you would give then with the movicol. I'm a little bit afraid with the gastrographene because the mm. child um, was vomiting, had a complete obstruction. And we know that if the gastrographene is aspirated, so if the child had vomited and you get this in your lungs, um, this can be very bad, the gastrographene. Uh, they have been... Uh, cases of lung edema and even of death uh, following gastrocalcin aspiration that have been described. So uh, I would have been a little bit afraid of putting the gastrocalcin at the same time than uh, the two other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then thank you very much okay, for this nice presentation. And we'll be happy to follow on uh, with Rita Gomez uh, for the next case. Hello. I'm going to present a case report of a girl with kissing fibrosis with an atypical variant in the CFTR gene. I do not have any conflicts of interest. This case is about a six-year-old girl. The neonatal screening was positive for kissing fibrosis and sweat test results were also positive. The genetic study showed heterozygous F508 DEL mutation and homozygous 90 variant in the intron 8 of the CFTR gene. She was initially followed in another CF center and then transferred to our hospital by the age of four. At the time, she presented with indirect signs of chronic respiratory failure since she was unable to cooperate in spirometry. She had severe pancreatic insufficiency and showed growth in the percentile 3 for weight and height. According to the literature, specifically the CFTR2 database, the combination F508 del and T9 variant usually does not cause kystic fibrosis, but a small number of patients may develop mild symptoms or be diagnosed with CF related disorders. However, this girl had to be submitted to her first pseudomonas eradication at six months of age, and throughout her life she had multiple resp respiratory exacerbations, which frequently led to hospitalizations. 
She has an intermittent pseudomonas infection and the latest respiratory sample cultures also identified uh, MRSA, Enterobacter cloacae, Aspergillus formigatus and Candida parapsilosis. Her current therapy consists in inhaled antibiotics, azithromycin, DNAs, salbutamol, multivitamin and fatty acid supplements, pancreatin, nocturnal non-invasive ventilation and supplemental O2, and also chest wall oxalation vests and daily respiratory physiotherapy. The chest CT scan you can see on picture 1A and B was done when she was 4 years old and already it shows a bilateral disseminated micronodular pattern sparing only the pleural sac funds associated with some bronchiectasis which is compatible with a miliary infectious process. Picture 2 shows our latest x-ray. We decided to present this case because there is very little information in the literature concerning the genotype-phenotype correlation of polytetrac variants in kystic fibrosis. The T9 alleles have been described to be very rare and usually associated with milder forms of the disease. We would like to open the discussion. Are there any patients at your, your centers with this genotype and such condition? What do you think would be the best approach now? She is already being evaluated for, for the possibility of a pulmonary transplantation, despite all the expected comorbidities and complications at such a young age. Until now, no CFTR modulator therapy has been specifically designed for this mutation. We are thinking about studying CFTR function and in vitro response to the current available drugs. We also propose the insertion of a gastrostomy to improve nutritional status, but parents are very reluctant. We would like to hear about your experience and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rita, for this presentation. Um, you have put your thing on, on yes. So I think uh, one very important comment um, uh, has, has come in, which was also my, my primary and most important thought is the one from uh, Laura Larisa, who asked uh, if the girl has underwent uh, or the girl underwent extensive genetic testing and sequencing. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, has uh, there been a search for large deletions also, for instance, of the CFTR gene? Yes, yes, and then Because, frankly, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, I very much doubt that the, the problem is the T9 uh, sequence. So you just have one uh, mutation that's found and the other one uh, is either it's another problem that the child has an ENAC overfunction problem or a mutation that you just not found because the T9 allele actually is is uh, is something protective for you you know mm -hmm. T5 or 7 would be T5 would be bad but T9 is protective so um, you know, and it's, it's also the experience of the CFTR2 registry where you see that T9 basically are, 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 are protective alleles. So uh, this is, this is a, it's a good yeah. point, but uh, I, I would rather suspect that the problem is, uh, is another mutation than the one that you, you described. Yes, that's, that's exactly our point. We, are, we were considering repeating the genetic test um, because, um, as you as you have said, the literature doesn't show any cases of uh, acoustic fibrosis with this variant causing any any symptoms or disease at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe you should look at the intronic regions. Sorry. You should look not only at the exons of the gene but also uh, of the you, you have to look at the intronic regions of the gene because it should be like it could be like a splice mutation, uh, yes. mutation in the promoter um, so this, this 
it would be the first way to better understand and to look for another mutation that would be not exonic, but intronic, for instance. And uh, the other um, thing that you propose to explore functionally uh, yeah. TFTR in this patient would be a good idea. Okay. Uh, you can perform two, two experiments. The first one is to look if the protein is expressed and if normally expressed by Western blood mm -hmm. to uh, mature or non-mature forms of CFTR. And uh, the second is to um, perform um, in uh, primary cell cultures uh, of the patients. Uh, for, exa for example, from nasal brushing, you can get uh, primary cultures yeah. and uh, see if the um, See, uh, and explore the response to uh, phoscoline and then uh, uh, and then uh, CFTR in inhibitor uh, to see if uh, it is uh, really uh, pathogenic. Um, I'm sorry, I I I, me I miss I missed uh, just a part of your talk. Uh, she had sweet test. Yes, yes, yes. all three are were positive. Yes, was so abnormal. Abnormal, yes, all three. Okay. Yes. So you already get the response, but if you want to go further, I think uh, NASA primary cell sculptures and Western blood uh, would be a way to go further. What do you think, Nicolas? Yes, um, I think also this is comments that have come in. Um, first of all, for the diagnosis part, uh, the differential diagnosis, of course, um, as you've done this, that you've also excluded some other immunodeficiencies or other, other problems. If you really want to see, um, like, uh, do we have a phenotype compatible with cystic fibrosis? Um, doing nasal PD measurements in this case would, would certainly be interesting if you have the availability to do this. And someone has also suggested that if you really have, depend, independent of the mutation you have, um, a CFTR, you know, a CF phenotype, you can try to use uh, organoids um, or system like has been proposed by Alice to look to explore um, before starting a treatment um, with a corrector uh, yes. uh, what, it, what you find in vitro. Okay. But of course you can also, if you don't have availability to this and you have at some time point the possibility to use a, a CFTR modulator just to start it and then monitor a patient and see do you have a, an increase uh, uh, you know, a decrease of your sweat test and uh, and um, maybe yeah. you can do functional assays. Yes, because in your in uh, primary cell cultures, you can test the drugs as well, the yeah. corrector and potentiators. But uh, it's not. I don't know if there is a lab in your town. Yeah. Yeah. We will actually do the organized organized study studies now. Um, we have discussed it with uh, um, Professor Margarita Tavares. Uh, Maral, Margarida Maral, and uh, we will do the, the studies now because okay. they are available in our country, in Lisbon in particular. Another comment that has come in that I think is also very important and I would absolutely support that is the question um, when you showed your x ray, uh, your CT scan or X ray, was it um, with yeah. the, 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 X, the CT scan with the nodular miliary picture? Uh, that was very suggestive for me for a non tuberculosis mycobacteria. Have you lavaged the child? Have you looked for this? Have, have, have you have excluded have, this? We have excluded the presence of uh, mycobacteria, yes. Yes, because that's, that would be the classical feature that you think no, of. No, no. Very good. Yes. I'm impressed of the severity of the, the disease of this child. Um, uh, even whatever the the, uh, the reason, and uh, because you know having a, this child uh, needing non-invasive ventilation, oxygen that's that's uh, horrible, and and really again uh, immunodeficiency or something else in in addition to CF seems to me quite likely and especially also if you have this picture of a, a disseminated miliary picture in the lung uh, it, it, it smells for me like uh, immunodeficiency and this is difficult to diagnose sometimes because there are so yeah. many possibilities and, right. and, and and the CF and immunodeficiency probably difficult. Thank you for your uh, opinion and suggestions. Very good. Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting case. Thank you, yes, very interesting.
and uh, I think we go on to the to the last case. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes or maybe 20 minutes left, left uh, before closing the session. And this is not the CF one, but one that we took, I think, from another um, group of presentation that I can add here, um, uh, presented by uh, Dr. Gutu. Hello, my name is Maria Gutu, and I present the case report of a toddler with pneumonia and pleural empyema. I have no conflict of interest disclosure. We admitted two years old female transferred from another hospital for severe general conditions, severe respiratory distress and high fever. One week prior admission, she had cough and fever for which she received azithromycin for one week with unfavorable evolution. She has no significant personal history. At the admission, she had severe general condition, tachypnea, desaturation without oxygen mask, severe respiratory distress with constant respiratory moon, dullness to percussion, and the absence of the vesicular murmur in the inferior two-third of the left hemithorax and the left apical tubular breath. Laboratory test indicates leukopenia with lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia. Severe anemia, respiratory alkalosis without metabolic compensation. Positive inflammatory syndrome and quantiferon TB cold test was negative. Hypoalbuminemia and low levels of total protein for which we did serum protein electrophoresis with low levels of albumin and albumin to globulin ratio and high values of alpha-1 and alpha-2. Coagulopathy due to sepsis and no immunoglobulin deficiency. The pleural fluid was cloudy and an exudative uh, fluid with the presence of streptococcus pneumoniae for which we did an antibiogram. Blood cultures and tracheal aspirate were negative and the rigid bronchoscopy didn't found any foreign body. First chest X-ray indicates complete opacification of the left hemithorax, the trachea and the heart are pushed to the right side. The abdominal and thoracic ultrasound revealed massive pleural effusion on the left hemithorax and complete collapse of, of the left lung. Here we can see the drain chest tube. The cardiovascular examination and ultrasound didn't found anything pathological. And some imaging from the CT scan. Also here we can see it. Here we can see it in the frontal plane. After one week, there is still complete opacification of the left hemithorax, but with the presence of air bronchogram, the thoracic ultrasound revealed no pleural empyema, partial expanded left lung, and left persistent diffuse pulmonary peripheral increased density. And the chest X-ray after two and three weeks of treatment. And the CT scan where we can see residual alveolar processes. So, atelectasis can be subsegmental, obstructive, or compressive. The toddler had atelectasis due to the pneumonia and the pleural empyema. The diagnoses are left pneumonia with streptococcus pneumonia with complete compressive atelectasis and pleural empyema with streptococcus pneumonia, sepsis, acute respiratory failure, hypoalbuminemia, and severe anemia due to infection and iron deficiency. The surgical team did a thoracocentesis, insert a drain chest tube and a central venous catheter. The medical treatment is with antibiotics, antifungal medication, human albumin and intratect, one administration each. The evolution was slow favorable with normal physical examination after one week with normal 
or a resolution laboratory test, and the Imagistic investigation revealed resolution of MPMA, left lung inflation, and residual alveolar processes. At the discharge, she received antibiotics for seven days and she will return after one month for re-evaluation. The toddler had complete atelectasis due to massive MPMA and severe pneumonia with streptococcus pneumonia and needed more than just one antibiotic. There were no fibrinolytics or VATs needed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nada, for this presentation. Shall I comment first? Uh, yeah, if you want. I'll okay, go. so I, I, I'm agree a little bit with one of the first comments uh, asking uh, why was the rigid bronchoscopy done? And I think personally, um, I, I need a little bit of explanation why so many investigations have been done in this patient. So as far as I understand, this is a child who had a pneumonia, which is not, uh, you know, she's not responded well to oral antibiotics. She came to your hospital in a septic state and you have done a chest X-ray and probably an ultrasound where you see an MPMA. And so um, probably from the lab workup, you would have been fine with the CRP, uh, differential blood uh, uh, levels and um, uh, blood cultures and looking in the fluid of your, um, your chest tube, um, what is the growth, which bacteria are grown there. Um, maybe do a PCR if you don't find the growth of the bacteria and maybe also look at the cells there, but then that's probably enough. And to treat the child with one antibiotic such as coamoxicillin or, um, or if it's pneumococcus even with amoxicillin or penicillin, would probably have been enough. So I a little bit wonder why the child has undergone went two CTs and a bronchoscopy. What, was this something I missed in the course uh, of the disease? The first CT was made to look after for a foreign body where we, when we didn't found it. And the second one, we wanted to see if there was any anomalies of the left uh, lung. That's why we did the second one. But why do you, did you look for a foreign body? Because there, will, there was no suggest, suggestive history of a foreign body in the medical history. Because of the age of the child. The parents not always uh, telling, telling us if the child had uh, swallowed something or not. Okay, because I agree with uh, Nicola. Uh, I've I would have performed a blood test, checked X-ray, and uh, the analysis of the pleural fluid, but I would have probably stopped there uh, for the first investigation and then treat the child and see if he's, uh, if he's improved. If, and then there is... Uh, the evolution was very low, low, favorable, and after one week with two antibiotics, uh, she was still having fever, and um, the inflammatory tests were still high positive. Okay. Uh, in, when you have a severe MPMA, the fact that the improvement is very slow is usual, uh, and uh, if there is no improvement, it's okay to perform a chest CT scan just to, to uh, evaluate the importance uh, of the pleural fluid and to see if a drainage is uh, necessary. Uh, regarding the antibiotic treatment, uh, I have just a comment uh, from what Nicola said. Uh, in, our in our experience, usually we, even if we get the bacteria, and here it was uh, streptococcus pneumonia, uh, we usually start with two antibiotics uh, to, good, to get a good and a deep penetration in the MPMA because it's difficult to reach. And we also uh, 
uh, and then when the child is well uh, with no more inflama inflammation, we decrease and go back to one antibiotic, but for a, uh, a long uh, period of time, we treat those children almost four to six weeks when it's a real MPMA to make sure that the, the, the cure is uh, total. Um, and uh, also, so I would have not performed the bronchoscopy as well. Okay, we uh, have maybe other questions. Well, a remark, someone who said uh, they could have done an ultrasound instead of a CT. Um, of course, yes, uh, that's what uh, we would do also. It it's always- it, the, this It was performed, the, yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay, then, then, uh, then that's fine. Um, Yes, someone talks about the principle of the Alara principle. I guess this is just as low as reasonable and as high as necessary, something like this. I don't know the principle, but it's probably that, that one. Um, uh, more questions? Uh, there is a question about the conservative therapy versus uh, the drainage. The, I think it's a good question. There is no, uh, as far as I know, uh, consensual guidelines about that, uh, when to drain and when not to drain and to wait for the antibiotics to be effective. Um, in our experience, when the MPMA is very important and when there is a compression of the lungs, and especially if there is a control lateral shift of the lung, and uh, if the MPMA is not well tolerated regarding respiratory status with oxygen dependency or regarding septic status with no improvement, then uh, the drain is indicated. But it's not, uh, it's not very often uh, indicated straightforward at the beginning. Uh, I don't know, Nicolas, if you have another experience. No, that's similar. What we would say, yes. And it's a good question because there is no. Exactly. If you have a medicinal shift, if you have um, a severe respiratory distress, if you have a huge amount of fluid, that's certainly an indication to perform uh, an intervention. Uh, the question always if you do a VAT or if you just do put the drain, depends a little bit if you see a septi or not on your ultrasound. Um, uh, if also, what's the experience of your surgeon of doing a VAT? Uh, and and uh, the chest PT is very interesting before you uh, put the drain because it will tell you if the MPMI is very important or if the condensation is very important. And it will also tell you if uh, there is a lot of um, small, uh, in France, in French we say logette. I don't know, Nicolas, how, how you would say that. Like uh, small cavities that are uh, uh, all uh, isolated with um, very thick um, septi. Fluid. Okay, uh, because if it's the case, then if you put only one drain, you you don't have any chance to drain everything. Okay, and so uh, this is when the fibrinolytic can be discussed. But uh, if the MPMI is free, there is no need for for fibrinolytic. Um, and there was also a question about local antibiotic. Uh, usually systemic antibiotics are sufficient. Uh, mm -mm. I think we have addressed uh, the main questions. I guess two, yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you very much for the presentations. They were all very, very nice and uh, with good discussions. Thank you for taking the time to, to do this. And uh, it's great. Uh, I very much like uh, when, when we have this from the participants and we can discuss uh, cases from all over the world. Uh, I think we are absolutely on time. And I think everyone, uh, well, I don't know where you are, but you must be hungry. So maybe it's um, breakfast or it's uh, lunch or it's uh, a late dinner that you will enjoy. But I wish you uh, uh, enjoy uh, the meal if you can, uh, if or if you continue um, with the questions. And uh, if you are so brave that uh, you follow Fabio and... Uh, 
is it just you? No, Fabio and I yes, am for the for the Q and A questions. Then um, I wish you a lot of courage, and uh, I thank you for the attention for being at the course uh, this morning. Okay, I would like to thank uh, Amy and uh, Melanie for the great organization of this first virtual summer school <laughs> for my part, for my for my part, um, and I thank everyone. Okay, and see you back for the Q and A examinations. <laughs> Okay, if I can uh, say something, uh, I would like, uh, together with Ernest Eber and Monica uh, Gappa, that are uh, the other two colleagues with whom we organize uh, the summer school, we would like to thanks a lot the ERS office. Uh, and I think that we had a, a very good experience because it was a new experience also for us to do a three-day uh, webinar course. And I think that we, it was very successful. Uh, according to all the questions that we receive on the chat, and we are sorry that we couldn't answer to all the questions personally, but I think that was really a great experience. And but I hope that next time we'll be able to do a face-to-face -face meeting in uh, uh, in Berlin, uh, because at the end it's probably more familiar than uh, uh, this course. So I don't know if Monica, you want to say something. No, I don't want to say something. I just want to say goodbye and thank you, everybody. Okay. So thank, thank you, Monica, for myself, Monica, to Ernst, to Fabio for organizing the course, and very much uh, to Amy and Melanie for the perfect organization. And thank, uh, you. thank you very much for the faculties, because uh, we couldn't do such a good course without a good faculty. <laughs> that is the success of the course. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Have you. a nice weekend. Bye-bye. See bye -bye. you next year in Rio. Thank See you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Bye. Amy. Guarda, vieni che sta ricerca ricominciamo. Sì, sì.